Well, thank you very much for having me here. And so, uh, just to speak on this subject, which is, uh, is there a relationship between uh, uh, fractionated atrial electrograms recorded during uh, sinus rhythm versus atrial fibrillation? So I think all the interest that has uh, come about in uh, complex fractionated electrograms to a large extent has been fueled uh, by the early observations made by Dr. Nadamani where he described, uh, as we all know, uh, a series of patients uh, that were uh, uh, undergoing AF ablation. And in those patients using uh, subjective analysis of uh, electrograms live during the procedure, um, he was able to determine areas in the atrium uh, where the electrograms appeared complex and fractionated. And his definition of complex and fractionated was that either the electrograms had multiple components and or there was an undulating baseline. Uh, it was a subjective interpretation of how the electrograms look, but nevertheless, uh, the data is compelling because when he targeted these areas, uh, he was able to, uh, in the majority of patients, terminate atrial fibrillation. And so, uh, there was a lot of interest in uh, uh, the complex fractionated electrograms uh, seen during atrial fibrillation. Now, uh, the definition that was used by uh, Dr. Nadamani was subjective, and he utilized uh, visualization of these electrograms with certain characteristics as well as the amplitude. Uh, but again, anytime you have a subjective interpretation of signals, um, it can vary from person to person. And uh, <clears throat> we have come up, as have many others, with a more objective criteria for uh, defining complex fractionated electrograms, at least during atrial fibrillation. Uh, and we have utilized a computer-based algorithm, and most of the mapping systems, uh, both contact and non-contact, have that algorithm built in. And utilizing that particular algorithm, in our experience, you can demarcate areas within the uh, left atrium and the right atrium that uh, show high frequency, very fast cycle lengths, less than 120 milliseconds, and that's our criteria uh, for quantifying these things as complex fractionated electrograms. Now, the mechanisms underlying these fractionated signals during atrial fibrillation, there are several that have been proposed. I mean, most folks believe that complex fractionated electrograms in some ways are responsible for the mechanisms underlying atrial fibrillation, and that's really the whole uh, uh, concept that has been then explored by targeting these signals to see how uh, atrial fibrillation responds. And so, uh, many people believe that these are actually the sources of atrial fibrillation. But then um, there are other uh, hypotheses also. So Dr. Halife and his group have shown in some very elegant studies that uh, in animal models during ongoing atrial fibrillation, actually the areas that demonstrate complex fractionated signals are not necessarily the source, but in fact they are on the periphery of the source where there is wavelet breaks. And so if you target those areas, you may not necessarily be targeting the source. And then, of course, there have been a lot of other hypotheses in terms of whether they simply represent a zone of slow conduction and not necessarily the source, whether they represent uh, tissue anisotropy, where multiple fibers come together, and again, not necessarily a source. And then, of course, there's been some uh, work to try to see if complex fractionated electrograms are actual surrogates for uh, ganglion black psi. And so targeting them, you actually modify the autonomics, which obviously has a lot of implications. So, Again, I think uh, complex fractionated electrograms in patients with atrial fibrillation, I, I think, are very exciting, and there's been some work done on them. But fractionated electrograms have also been observed in the atria during sinus rhythm. I mean, this is something that all of us are familiar with in certain areas, for example, the cabotracus pedisthmus region, uh, the coronary sinus osteum, uh, the region of the slow path. I mean, all of these locations are where frequently we find signals that have multiple components even during sinus rhythm and sometimes we've attributed them to be slow pathway potentials and things of that nature. The first time that somebody actually looked at them carefully in the context of atrial fibrillation was uh, uh, this elegant study by Dr. Pachon from Brazil uh, and he reported his data uh, with uh, the hypothesis that he felt that you know when you explore in the atria as he did in his uh, case series of about 30 or 40 patients, what he noted was that there were certain locations where uh, 
the sinus rhythm electrogram had multiple components. And then he was able to do a fast Fourier transform of the signal in places where there were not these multi-component signals as well as the places where there were multi-component signals. And in spots where the electrograms were fractionated, he was able to demonstrate uh, that there was a dominant frequency, but in addition to that, there were several harmonics, so that if you did the frequency plot of the signal, you found several peaks spread out. And this particular manifestation on the spectral analysis, uh, where there were several peaks in addition to the dominant peak, he called this fibrillar conduction. And his hypothesis was that fibrillar conduction in some ways is representative of uh, at least a mechanism that sustains air. And so then the next logical step was for him to target these areas. And the distribution was in the septum, in the appendage, near the pulmonary veins, not unlike where Dr. Nadamani had found his original complex electrograms during air. And he targeted these uh, and found, just like Dr. Nadamani had done, that there was long-term benefit of doing this in terms of uh, AF control. Mind you, but these were electrograms that were targeted in sinus rhythm only, and their locations were also determined during sinus rhythm. So, you know, that started this, you know, interest in the, uh, in the field where, you know, people are looking at uh, potential AF nests, as he called them, where fibrillar conduction was noted during sinus rhythm as possibly the sources of AF. Now, when we look at some of the studies, and this is relatively recent work, and people have explored where uh, you might find complex electrograms during sinus rhythm. And so this is a very interesting study that's been reported in a two-part series by uh, Dr. Kalman and his group, where using the right atrium as a surrogate for what may be happening in both the chambers, he looked at uh, the voltage characteristics during sinus rhythm and uh, their distribution in different age groups. So he had three groups of patients, uh, a group where folks were older than 60 or 65 years, a group where patients were younger than 30 years, and a group in between them. And what he found was that uh, uh, as you get older, clearly there is a decrease in the overall atrial voltage based on contact electroanatomic mapping. And then uh, he also looked at the distribution of complex electrograms, and clearly in the aging population, the ones that demonstrated the lowest amplitudes is also where there was the highest incidence of complex fractionated signals. So, you know, potentially all of this could be tied together. Atrial fibrillation happens in people as they get older, and one of the likely causes may be that as you get older, there is uh, more fibrosis in the atria, and that fibrosis results in both a reduction in the overall amplitude, but also fractionation of normal conduction, and that's what translates into uh, this particular pattern of fragmentation. But again, from that data, you can't really hypothesize that wherever you find fractionated electrograms is where the sources of AF are. Now, another uh, paper, which is, again, a very elegant study, and this is done by Dr. Shiv Kumar and his colleagues, uh, where, again, in a series of patients with paroxysmal AF, uh, they sampled multiple areas in the left and the right atrium and reported uh, three different patterns of electrograms. So one pattern was just straight clean electrograms, uh, and then they observed two types of fractionated electrograms. One was a low amplitude fractionated signal, and the other was a high amplitude fractionated signal. And so once they had demarcated their locations, and they seemed to follow a pattern so that the high frequency, high amplitude fractionated electrograms were distributed differently than the low amplitude uh, fractionated electrogram. So after he made that observation, then he went on <clears throat> to target these areas. And while he was delivering energy uh, at these locations, he also looked at the changes in the autonomics, which he gauged either by seeing a dramatic reduction in the underlying sinus rate during the ablation, or he had a catheter across the his bundle region, so he looked for PR prolongation or AH interval increase as a surrogate for parasympathetic stimulation. And so what he found was that uh, in patients where uh, the high amplitude fractionated electrograms were targeted, the majority of those sites showed some change in the autonomics. Whereas the other locations, including the places where the amplitude of the signal was low despite the fractionation, uh, 
you no longer saw that autonomic modulation. So in his observations, which is probably the next step, uh, that uh, when you find complex fractions between electrograms of a certain nature, they are perhaps a surrogate for ganglion plexi or something that modulates the autonomics. And then there is this uh, other very interesting study that has been reported by Dr. Xi'an Chen and his crew. And uh, their work involved the non-contact electroanatomic mapping system, which again has the capability, just like you can visually do it, uh, the system can do it too, analyze electrograms and provide for you a spectral analysis to show where there are complex fractionated signals during sinus rhythm. And so this was an interesting series because um, he reported the distribution of these complex fractionated signals during sinus rhythm. And then uh, he found the distribution to be uh, of two patterns. One where it was predominantly in and around the pulmonary veins, and the second where in addition to the pulmonary veins, it was also found in other locations. Now, doing pulmonary vein isolation in, in patients where the distribution was exclusively around the pulmonary veins, he was able to modify them so that the second map after PV isolation did not show the complex fractionated signal. In the second group, though, where the distribution was both within and outside the PVs, obviously just doing the PV isolation, he couldn't get rid of the electrograms in remote locations. And then he went on to do inducibility of AF after the completion of PV isolation. And in patients where complex fractionated signals during sinus rhythm were outside the pulmonary veins, the inducibility was statistically higher than it was where they were just confined to the pulmonary veins. Again, suggesting that, you know, there is some mechanistic role for these signals, whether it's direct or it's by association, we don't know. So obviously we as a group have been interested in this. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, two uh, projects that are being presented at the meeting uh, here by our fellows. Uh, this was done primarily by uh, a fellow that we have visiting with us from Hungary, Dr. Laszlo Sabi. Uh, this is his work together in collaboration with Dr. Gerstenfeld, who does a lot of these uh, uh, <coughs> computer analysis. So the first one, which I believe is being presented tomorrow, is comparison of time and frequency domain measures of sinus rhythm electrogram fragmentation. Now, this is in many ways validating uh, the tools that we have for reporting fractionated electrograms in the sense that um, when I showed you the work by Dr. Shian Chen's group, uh, he demonstrated how the non-contact electroanatomic mapping system is capable of providing a spectral analysis of the signal during sinus rhythm. It's an automated feature. You simply click on a button and it uh, recalibrates the map and then shows you in a color distribution where complex fractionated signals are versus not. So the first part of um, the work that Dr. Zaghi is presenting is to see whether there is true correlation between what the system reports and what's indeed happening. So here is a map uh, uh, <clears throat> of the left atrium which is shown in the RAO projection. So you're basically looking at the anterior and septal aspect of the chamber. You can see the pulmonary veins, you can see the appendage, you can see the mitral annulus. So uh, the, the map on top is uh, uh, an LA shell where Dr. Zavi went and analyzed each of these electrograms visually. So you're talking about analyzing about 300 plus electrograms. It took him a week to do this, but at each of these spots he sampled the signal and using a criteria that we uh, pre-specified as to what would be complex fractionated, multiple peaks, multiple uh, troughs. If you found a signal like that, then he gave it a certain color. And if you didn't find a signal like that, and he found a clean signal, which is shown on the right side, then it was given a different color. So by post-processing the maps that were acquired during sinus rhythm in patients undergoing atrial fibrillation, he was able to demarcate visually um, sites where the signals were fractionated. And in this particular instance, the color purple represents the fractionated signal. So just to remind you again, it took him sometimes, you know, almost a week to get this post-processing done. Now at the bottom is uh, an LA shell in the same patient that he analyzed visually, but here after you acquired the chamber, you simply click on a system and within five seconds, the system gives you a map with its own spectral analysis of the signal. So the point of this particular uh, study was that 
uh, whether there is co-relationship between what's truly happening versus what the system is reporting. And his data suggests that the co-relationship is actually pretty good. So when the system tells you, uh, based on its spectral analysis, that this area has fractionation and another area does not, I think it's reliable. So that was the first thing that we needed to establish. And certainly it seems like the system can. Now the second part, which is you know, in some ways the focus of our discussion today, which is, is there a relationship between fractionated atrial electrograms recorded during sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation? I think I touched on it briefly based on the work of some other investigators where the data is mixed. I mean, some things suggest that there is an association. Uh, I think it's really not proven yet whether it's mechanistically exactly that. And so that's what we wanted to explore in this. And the way we went about doing this, and this is an oral abstract that Dr. Sagi I think is presenting on Friday. Um, and here uh, what we tried to do is uh, look at uh, the distribution of the fractionated electrograms during sinus rhythm using uh, non-contact electronatomic mapping. And then uh, the patients, uh, either they presented in AF, so the first set of signals were acquired during AF, or if they weren't in AF, then after we had acquired the map during sinus rhythm, AF was induced, and we got another set of complex fractionated electrograms. So here is a typical example of the distribution of uh, complex fractionated electrograms that we acquired using our system during atrial fibrillation. And just like you know, others have reported, uh, the distribution of the signal in our experience, the CFEs are most commonly observed in the septum, uh, in and around the left atrial appendage, sometimes in the vicinity of the pulmonary veins, and around the mitral annulus. So this is consistent with uh, where we typically expect uh, complex signals during AF. Now, the second uh, uh, set of uh, images here represent the same patient in which uh, complex fractionated electrograms have been acquired during sinus rhythm, once again using the system uh, as I defined the methodology. And so in this particular uh, case, if you look at the correlationship of the distribution of complex atrial fractionated electrograms during sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation, there's only a very narrow zone in the anterior segment of the left atrium where there seems to be a correlationship. When we looked at our entire series and the different regions in the left atrium for this overall correlationship between complex electrograms during sinus rhythm uh, versus complex electrograms during atrial fibrillation, the correlationship overall was not uh, very good. So, Based on the series, our conclusion is that at least when it comes to overlap in regions that demonstrate complex fractionated electrograms during AF versus sinus rhythm, uh, this overlap does not seem to be there. Or if it is, it is extremely small. Um, we've also gone on to show uh, the mechanisms underlying uh, these complex electrograms, and usually they are found in areas where there is wave front collision, even in sinus rhythm, and that's some of the work that Dr. Sagi is going to be presenting. And so, uh, based on our findings, the conclusion that we have reached is uh, that sinus rhythm fractionation is not a surrogate for complex fractionated electrograms that we observed during uh, atrial fibrillation.